everyone, and welcome to episode 36 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sobalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. This podcast is just one of the offshoots of Medievalist.net, a website that was started up 11 years ago by Peter Konechny and Sandra Alvarez, two friends from the University of Toronto with the lofty goals of bringing medieval studies to the people and maybe, just maybe, earning some pocket change. Eleven years may not seem like all that long, especially to people interested in the Middle Ages, but eleven years ago, when Medievalist.net started up, and coincidentally, when I started writing my own little blog just up the road from Peter and Sandra, websites like these were few and far between. Sandra was back in Toronto this week, so I asked these two trailblazers to sit with me in my kitchen table and tell me about the journey that's brought them where they are today. We were joined by my dog, George, and between the four of us, we talked about how the field has changed over the past decade and what it means for today's independent scholars. Okay, guys, so let's talk about um, what it was like when you started Medievalist.net. So first of all, how did it start between the two of you? How did you get Medievalist.net going? Well, I guess the first thing to say is we wanted to get money. (laughs) No. It was, it was. We wanted to get enough money to go to Kalamazoo each year. For, there's a big medieval congress there, and that was our our, all, our initial goal. No, what? actually, back up the train. Our initial goal, I said to him, I'm like, if we make enough money to buy a beer and a burger, it's gold. And we surpassed that goal, <laughs> obviously, because we were talking to you. Yeah. I had I had started at Medievalist.net a few months before, but I didn't really know exactly what I had wanted to do. So it kind of I, I started it for a couple of months, and then I shut it down. And that's uh, and then I was kind of rethinking of what what it should be, and that's when I approached Sandra to say, "Hey, I need a partner to, in this, and I want you to be my partner." And so that was the kind of um, the early stages of creating uh, what we wanted, what we figured was a site that the world needed, <laughs> the entire world. Sorry, there's going to be a lot of scoffing. That's funny. That is their dynamic, so you're going to hear a lot of scoffing. But this is the love of years of working together that people are hearing right now. So this, <laughs> so this started back what in 2008, wasn't it? Yeah, September 2008. Yeah. And we had known each other for at least a little over 10 years uh, since yeah. then. So. We we met at the University of Toronto. Um, one of our professors introduced us. Um, and thought that we would get along like a house on fire, obviously. And so we just ended up hanging out and becoming friends. Friends in medieval studies. So did you meet in a medieval medieval program? Where did you meet? Yeah, it was the uh, University of Toronto. And it, it was, uh, yeah, Isabella Koshlin, uh, who's uh, now the uh, interim director of the Center of Medieval Studies. So good on you, Isabel. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, we met in her class. And um, yeah, we just ended up becoming friends was it the high middle ages course i think that she was running at the yeah, time because yeah, you weren't in her monasticism course that i was taking yeah. you missed out Clooney was awesome <laughs> yeah peter he misses out on a lot of stuff right peter okay so you decide you're going to start a website you're going to make up just enough to have a beer and a burger and go to kalamazoo maybe all three i mean like why <laughs> why not shoot for the stars if <laughs> you're living your best life at that point right so, did you make enough to go to Kalamazoo that first year? No. Oh yeah, we no, did. did we? Yeah, we definitely. We. Uh, I, I, horrible. I, I think like the first month was like a September. We wound up making like thirty or forty dollars, which was uh, oh. We, dinner. We went out for dinner. Yeah, we probably. That's we actually probably didn't get paid until we had to get like break that hundred dollar yeah, threshold. That's but, true. But we did break that in the second month. And the like, the really the initial site was we're just going to post links to articles, and we had gotten permission to publish like um, I don't know we won't it was dozens and dozens of articles that were from these uh, more much more obscure journals, uh, and we just got permission, and so we kind of posted that, and we were just putting in these links uh, and just starting to get like our. And toes into news kind of the golden age of facebook too and the golden age of like organic um this was before pay to play kind of stuff and you could really get a good following organically just building a community so we came in at the the right time accidentally but it kind of worked out that way and then you know as time went on um and things got monetized 
especially with the social media platforms, then it was like, oh, you know, you have to pay to boost things and stuff. But when we started out, it was really a good time because there was just so much community going on. And it was really rapid growth at that time, too. Our our initial uh, strength was based just purely on social media. And uh, there was a point where we were doubling our like our social uh, media numbers each month uh, so we went from like a thousand to two thousand to four to ten to twenty that's that's doubling right close to doubling so but even better like like it was uh but that kind of you know tra- trajectory we were on which would like we didn't realize it like at the time that like we knew hey wow there's a lot more people coming but we didn't know where they were or you know we you know, we're not from the uh, you know valley, the you know San Francisco Valley, and no, that kind of like that. It's called Silicon Valley, not San Francisco <laughs> that, Valley. That's why I don't know it. That's. Oh, uh, but you can ask him about obscure battles from the Middle Ages. He's got that down. He's got lots of <laughs> lots of old valleys to talk about. <laughs> okay, so you make enough. You go to your first Kalamazoo, and going to your first Kalamazoo, you went as Medievalist.net. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what was that like? intimidating very very intimidating i i think like i was saying um there were probably us and a couple other independent scholars there but it felt very i don't know how to quite say just not ostracizing people were nice but very intimidating because we weren't affiliated with the university we didn't have like phds and we were kind of there reporting on what was going on and there was i always felt like there was a bit of derision and kind of people looking down their noses a bit at us when we first when we first started doing this and um it's hard to overcome i think there was that much more so than today that kind of like oh you're independence why are you here And it was uncomfortable, and we just sort of pushed through and kept going and kept showing up. And eventually, it sort of, I felt like people were tolerant, and the tolerance grew to people liking us and then kind of accepting us in their community. But that was like a while coming. That wasn't immediate at all. There was definitely, I felt like, hoops we had to jump through. I don't know about you, but that was like my personal feeling when I was there. One thing uh, I, I, I got uh, quickly was these people asking, like, where am I getting funding? Who, what, you know, why, the, why are we the existing? And, like, uh, what's the purpose? Like, who, you know, people, I think people were, like, uh, com- confused because they were kind of thinking this must be some sort of academic project. And, and, and I, can't, I can't blame them because all the other attempts to do a kind of a site like we were doing was, uh, you know, uh, early PhD, like uh, early professors and uh, things like that, trying to do an academic version of the website, which you know, if you remember, like uh, NetSurf or uh, the, the Labyrinth, things like that, the online reference book, uh, which all, you know, were really good attempts, but they never kind of were able to kind of continue on. Uh, so I think people thought of us as that. And so it was kind of like, hey, no, we're actually just independent. And uh... and then I had to say, and that's when the outrage happened, when they realized, oh, well, you're not affiliated with a university. You don't have a grant to do this. You're doing this. How dare you monetize medieval studies? How dare you come in here? You're nobodies. You don't have PhDs and make money. And I'm scratching there going, I'm scratching my head thinking, you're making money in medieval studies to hell with you like why can't I make money I mean I kind of felt like I I want to be here and sort of like smash this glass ceiling and this pretentious nonsense because I think that Peter and I found a path that was academic but not the typical BA MA PhD professor path and I that I don't know what the reaction, but it irritated a lot of people. And, you know, I, we just persevered, but it wasn't easy. We, we we were like one to say before people who were doing like live tweeting of conferences, we were the virtually only people that would report on, Hey, this is what's being talked about. 
uh, to give it to the wider audience. Not everyone appreciated that. No, there was a lot of pushback in the early days. People yeah. were like, I don't want you filming. I don't want you taking pictures. What are you writing? And, you know, eventually we got um, permission. We would contact administrators beforehand, and they would notify people that we are here to um, report on this event. And um, if they didn't like it, somebody could approach us and tell us, you can do this, but not this. And it, it became better as time went on. Yeah, I, th I think as people uh, learned, hey, this what Medievalist.net is, and uh, we were getting an audience, mm -hmm. you know, people uh, quickly kind of said, this is a really kind of good way to outreach to the general public. This is actually a good way for me to learn about, the, uh, a lot of people would say, I wound up learning quite a lot by going onto your website. Uh, and and that kind of I think you know set us kind of like on a just general trend that oh we're, you know we're not horrible people. And yeah, I mean when you think about it, it's not like you're creating vast wealth. You're making like enough to buy pizza <laughs> at Bilbo's yeah. in Kalamazoo, and that was that was it. Like doing it for the actual love of being there. So That's I think that once goals. yeah, <laughs> yeah was, life goals. Yeah. We both had like uh, day jobs, and this was something that we would do in evenings and weekends. So I was working when I was living, still living in Toronto. I was working like in human resources, and I was working like this nine to five intensive job. And I would be like posting stuff on my lunch for medievalists, and then writing stuff after work. And it was like I had two full time jobs. It wasn't like we were rolling in cash and it was it was hard it was hard and these people were just so outraged that we kind of wandered into their little academic world and uh you know pop their bubble but sorry not sorry <laughs> do you still feel like it's the same now do you feel like people still have the same perspective or do you feel like it's changed for independent people scholars uh, i think it's changed massively and i'm so happy i mean I think there's still a little bit of that uh, pompous residue left over. Uh, I call it pompous residue. But um, I think for the most part that things have exploded now with Twitter and independent scholars and independent research and people don't look, their, look down their noses at it anymore. There are a lot more people doing what we started doing and they're respected and I'm I applaud them and I'm so happy because I don't think that medieval studies or early modern or ancient history or any period in history is just a space for you if you have a PhD in it or you're some kind of, you know, like an academic, it's just for you and nobody else can come into that. You're not going to get fresh blood, you're not going to improve your area of study you're chasing people away. You're chasing away the people that you want to continue on with this by making it inaccessible to them. So, Yeah, and I think that the, uh, if nothing else, the job market within academia has really changed and that's really made for a lot of independent scholars who have really great skills, whether it's at the BA level, MA level, PhD level. So, yeah. The... We've kind of seen over the years is like, you know, people come up and it's like, like they want to kind of emulate in us and find... A a path to you know talk about the Middle Ages or be a historian or you know uh, find that path and like they can see this as an example of like hey this is one that was successful although you know I don't know how successful you know I think we've always kind of been like oh yeah we're the greatest thing since sliced bread with you know. well that's that's what you've always said that's, that's what I've always said yeah yeah but you know in, in you know reality it's you know it's it's a tough slog but. You know, people have, have seen, like, they think, like, oh, this is how a way that I also can, you know, find some sort of uh, working life in the Middle Ages outside of a, a university uh, classroom. I think another reason, too, that we started doing this was because our day jobs, we, we didn't love them, let's be honest. And this, on the side, allowed us to do what we had a passion for and kind of make that painful, boring day job better that, you know, so we had a side hustle as they call it nowadays. And I'm just really, really thrilled that so many more people are becoming independent scholars and jumping on that side hustle, you know, accountant by day, 
18th century historian by night great good on you or you know classicist by night and like fireman by day like it I'm, I think it's fantastic and I I want to see more of it and I want to encourage it and I guess my thing now is like to use the platform that I have to boost people who are coming up and trying the same thing that we started back in yeah. 2008 yeah, and I have to say that you are great about that. When there is a discussion about, um, I'm independent, I don't really know what to do on social media. Sandra's always there. She's in there helping people feel confident in their side hustle or their their new job being an independent scholar. So awesome. Good on you, pal. <laughs> but it's funny because I, I, um, I'll encourage people, but I suffer horribly with imposter syndrome. I have days where I'm like, I'm such a hack you know but you have to overcome it yeah and we we should say that your imposter syndrome it's a real thing for you and it's also not what we see from the outside because you have another job that you're doing right now so you edit the medieval magazine but you're also editing another magazine as well so you obviously have chops what's your other job um i'm doing ancient history magazine as well um, so now I'm editing two magazines and I'm fully immersed in my world. So coming up from working a day job and having a side hustle and persevering, persevering. Now I'm actually working in history full time, which was the dream. And yeah, I'm just at a really, really good place. And like, you know, Peter's also like living his dream. Yeah, Peter, what else do you do? Well, uh, besides Medievalist.net, uh, I'm also the editor of Medieval Warfare magazine. So it's kind of a sister publication, and we wound up, uh, it, we're both, it's the same company that runs both magazines. I will never be rid of him. Yeah. That is so true. He's like a barnacle. Yeah, he is. Just yeah. breaking him off. So, uh, so I should I should make it clear actually that we've actually split the company of Medievalist.net oh, uh, right. oh, a little over a year, a little, two years two ago. Years ago. Uh, where you know we had uh, this digital magazine uh, called the Medieval Magazine when you have the website, and uh, so we you know mutually for lots of reasons, uh, but you know none, none none in hatred of each other. So no. so like um, I'm running the Medieval Magazine, Peter's doing Medievalist.net, but I mean we've been friends for twenty plus years since we were two. No one lying. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, yes. Um, yeah, and. Um, I live in in London, England now, and he lives in Canada. It's just it's easier if we're doing our own thing, and we're still supporting each other. We still like boost each other. We still, you know, um, we're still really good friends. Uh, and so, like, it was uh, it was very much just a business decision for yeah. both of us to kind of split the company and. Uh, take the, what we, we really were passionate about at that time, and, and I think still are. Like you, you want like the digital magazine. Uh, you know, I, lo- I love doing the website uh, and uh, kind of creating. So, and and from there, and we kind of just keep supporting each other. But uh, like in in terms of a business, like we're both kind of a separate entities. So. Yeah, we are. But we're just, it, it, and it's nice that way because like things could have gone really south, and they didn't. And um, yeah, like. I really enjoy doing what I'm doing, and um, it, I, the website aspect of it, I didn't like as much, oddly enough. So it worked out for the best. That works out, and I didn't have to choose. I write for both of you <laughs> <laughs> because I couldn't choose. I couldn't choose between choose you. So me. that's good. <laughs> yeah, and that is why we are all sitting around a kitchen table listening to my dog walk around. <laughs> so, Peter, have you found that the fields really changed since you started? Yeah, I think uh, right now uh, there's a lot more opportunities uh, for people to uh, talk about the Middle Ages to a wider audience. Uh, podcasting, obviously, is, is one of them, and that's. Uh, uh, but other people have been creating websites or web content, and I find like right now the, the something I really want to get into myself, but I see is people creating YouTube videos that are often really uh, well done. Uh, that talk about Middle Ages and other parts of history, that I see as something where you can get millions of people watching your videos. Uh, and it's a way to learn. Uh, you know, some channels are better than others. Some are really terrible. But I, th- I think those where I see is like there's opportunities and also as a way of engaging the public. But 
uh, it's not just that there's medieval festivals uh there is people creating uh, products on uh etsy or kickstarter i remember a person one person did like a comic book uh like a viking coloring book uh which uh, did very very well uh and like and that was based on her academic uh experience is to be able to create stuff like that and that's something we try and encourage we like look for ways to, we look always for ways to encourage people that are trying to promote the middle ages i think the gatekeeping is crumbling i really do and i think that whether it's through websites or magazines or independently writing books or making medieval shoes or wallets or whatever on Etsy, they're finding ways around the gate. You cannot keep that. It's it's not going to stay up. It's just not. I think the tide has come in and people realize that, hey, we can have a career doing medieval history or Victorian history or Tudor history. We don't need you to tell us that we can't do it. And that's really encouraging. And we were there when that all kicked off, I guess. Yeah, I've seen that. And it's starting to go the opposite way, which I think is really quite nice. We were talking earlier that people people are starting to read medievalist.net as scholars to get a foothold on a, a new topic and start to research about that. And that was something that surprised me when I started writing for you two. That was 2013. Um, and I I was expecting it to be kind of people who watch TV and then they'd read to find out more. But I noticed that scholars were using it as well. And uh, there's, there's a whole bunch more independent scholars that show up at conferences. And there's... They actually recognize us, which is <laughs> kind of a strange thing. And they're starting to use independent work, our work, in the classroom. And I think that's kind of a great reversal that we can work together in ways that are productive. I'm seeing this a lot now. And of course, really happy in my place. I'm teaching right now as well, but I still think of myself as an independent scholar. And that work like working with academics with, who are in, you know, your, your classic history departments. I think we can work together, and I'm seeing that a lot. It's good. It's good to see. I what like to see think, that. Do you, think, do you think it's come, like, as you yourself in your experience, do you think it's come far? Yeah, I mean, I went to Kalamazoo with Medievalist.net. It was uh, probably 2014, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was mostly welcomed by people, but there was – one or two people there that that were not excited to see that my name tag said medievalist.net and now when I go there I have met a lot more people and that's part of it but also people will recognize my name before they even see medievalist.net because they've seen my writing around and I don't I don't see their faces fall anymore when they see that um <laughs> cuz it used to be something that you know people would look at you and um they would think I don't know, like, I don't know if I should be talking to, should be seen talking to yeah. this person. Um, mm-hmm. And now people look at that and they see that not only am I not a danger to them, but I could be a help to them because uh, one of the things that is advantageous to being an independent scholar is we're, we're usually very plugged in to social media and we can amplify the voices of the scholars as well and bring the people to them. And that's always kind of been what, what my plan was when I started to write um, was to be kind of a gateway drug to get people to be interested. They already had an interest to come yeah. and read my work and point them in the direction of other work because I'm not a specialist, I'm a generalist. So really to point people in the direction of scholars, that's something that we can do. And I'm starting to see when I go places, uh, traditional academic spaces, I'm seeing people look at independent scholars as a way to, to get the word out. And that's something I really... Think it's awesome. People excited to show them that they can do it. They they don't have to go through a traditional route to be involved in a history passion. So I think when they see us doing it, you doing it, and we're out there boosting people, we give them sort of like a hope that yeah, I could do this. I could totally run my own website. I could totally be an editor. I could write a book. Why not? They are doing it too. So mm-hmm. I think that it is a gateway drug. So let's keep selling those kids those drugs. <laughs> Can I say that on there? <laughs> we mean selling kids on medieval studies. Medieval study drugs. Yeah. 
<laughs> we're so oh, we're getting people interested in medieval studies. Peter, what do you want to say? <laughs> they, I, I like the fact that there's a lot of kind of scholars that want to get involved, not just with medievalist.net, but also find ways of reaching out to the general public, like other podcasters. Um, like I'm thinking of the two gentlemen that run Saga Thing. And like they're both, you know, professors at like various universities, but they come together to do this uh, talk every every week uh, about the sagas and reach out to like a wider audience. Um, and I think they like and they I think identify themselves when they're at at Kalamazoo. Is they're part of Saga Thing as more than even being a professor of. Uh, this university and uh, like an Icelandic studies specialist that's you no know, I'm also this you know podcaster so. mm-hmm. and this is like within our own community and that's that's kind of great so I I think that the there was a moment that kind of surprised me and it, this person if he's listening he knows who he is I got hugged at Kalamazoo just out of the blue I was walking down the hallway someone spotted me and gave me this big hug I'd never met him before but he he gave me a big hug and thanked me for my work because I think he was using it in the classroom and so that was that was a huge kind of moment for me where I rec- recognized that the stuff that we're doing um, is is getting not only some traction but also some recognition as being important and this is a good moment to say that you know I just I just won the award for outreach with the lone medievalists um, group and uh, that was great for me because I'm just so happy that it exists oh, that's, really good. <laughs> that's amazing you should be very proud of yourself. I'm very proud of my... My mom is proud of me, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm happy, but I mean, I'm, I'm just more happy that it exists because there are so many great independent scholars out there. And I think you guys had to push through a lot to get there. Blaze the trail for us. The, it, it, it's like we've, now it's about 11 years old, Medievalist.net, and it's like and it's been a fun ride i can say like you know like how many bad days are have maybe i can count like on my fingers yeah, yeah. yeah but like in general like this is this is what i get to do for fun like uh you know oh you know what was me that has to read a book about middle ages for an afternoon yeah. so i had to add this is interesting when we started out there was a real reticent um attitude about taking on social media people were like tweeting you're tweeting my paper or you're photographing or whatever and people were really paranoid and sort of protective about their work and not wanting to share and kind of like this sort of hoarding kind of mentality and they thought that I don't know what we were going to run some kind of tabloid expose on them or something and now like within a few years of that super closed off closed ranks kind of thing it's exploded and professors are tweeting and scholars are tweeting and they've taken it on they're like I'm a professor and a podcaster and it's amazing to see how the tides shifted from people who thought oh social media that's awful we don't want it in in this academic setting to embracing it and now using it as a a channel to the gateway drug channel (laughs) one thing that like that we wanted to do early on was make sure that we wanted to promote the works that people are doing now about the middle ages and and say to the wider public this is really interesting stuff this is uh new engaging research we want to let you know about it we want to let you know this person is doing that um i i think people as soon as they can realize that you know we're not there to make fun of them or not there to bash them i think that that's helped with the acceptance of what medievalist.net was going to be about you know as we transitioned also as where we we brought you along danielle into writing and then we brought on other writers uh which were often like younger academics uh that you know hey listen to their voices uh so that also has kind of helped us kind of in in a sense that you know oh yeah you know we're here to offer this voice to often people that have trouble you know reaching out to a larger audience yeah and i think this is actually kind of really resonating for me because there was that article that came out just a few days ago i don't know if you saw it about how um scholars are writing for the wrong publications like quote unquote wrong publications if they want to get tenure they should not be writing for these public outlets and i would say to that um that 
writing for medievalist.net, writing for the medieval magazine is a great way to get your name out in the community and get that recognition that you need in order to get more opportunities to write for journals, to write elsewhere, to have a conference paper accepted. So I would say like this independent route, you can start that as a scholar. It's not the wrong way to go about it. I'm not sure there is a wrong way to go about it, but this writing is a great way to get your name out there. That's just another form of gatekeeping of saying that, oh, you know, if you write for a blog you're putting a nail in your in your tenure coffin and I just think that's that's garbage I mean it's basically saying that this is better than that and I don't think that's the case anymore I think that history blogging has really rocketed and the quality is there now maybe it wasn't as great you know 10 years ago or something but now journal blog they're on equal footing as far as I'm concerned people who are putting these things together are putting in the time and the research and the scholarship so that's a really kind of shockingly dated attitude I, I think read the article but can you send me the link I'm I'll curious. send you the link it's I think the general opinion was it, it is out of date because of that but what do you want to say Peter like medievalist.net started because scholars tried to do something similar and uh, were denied tenure and were, were said that this is worthless. It was worthless to reach out to the general public. Wow. I, I can understand, like, if you write a dissertation, you are essentially writing for your committee. Uh, and and that, is, that is one way. We are, are here about to, I want you to reach out to the wider audience of people that enjoy the Middle Ages or want to learn about history or have myths about uh, have these kind of false and myth mythological notions about what the medieval past was like and kind of uh offer your opinions and and reach out to to the wider world and look there are plenty of people that will say no i'm just really interested in you know my kind of corner of research and kind of talking with my fellow scholars you, you don't need to be at medievalist.net i want people that think uh, I have a voice that should be heard by others and bring them in and teach them about the Middle Ages. So like we see ourselves as this, you know, a chance to for people to learn and to and others to teach uh, about what they know about the, the medieval past. I just want to get people excited about history full stop. Like that's always been my overriding goal is to get people who are whether they're enthusiasts or considering a career in academia or considering some kind of a history related thing that to get them excited and also the more people get excited about it and the more um, support it has the there's less of a chance of these departments and things getting shut down which you know because people are like oh well who, who the hell needs to study about you know Abelard or you know Thomas Aquinas or something and they just don't see a value in studying, you know, medieval history or whatever. And I think that the scholarship that's coming now, especially with independent scholars, people coming from varied backgrounds and promoting it is completely changing that landscape. My greatest joy was, uh, and I've heard on a few occasions, is people that come up to me at a conference and say, I got involved in learning about the Middle Ages uh, through Medievalist.net and decided I want to do uh, my like undergrad. I shifted my undergrad to Medieval Studies and then I did my uh, graduate work and now here I'm in Kalamazoo and oh, presenting a paper. And uh, that really, you know, I find that like the, the ultimate kind of uh, satisfaction from this kind of work is like, you know, helped inspire a person that's gone on to do really good things. We've converted another one. <laughs> I know, and now, now the website's old enough. We are old enough that we are those people <laughs> that inspired the youngins. And it's it's actually, it's really, it's really nice. There is no feeling like that. It's amazing. <laughs> And you guys, for all of the projects that you're doing, for the magazine editing that you're doing, for the web editing you're doing, you're accepting writing from people who are in the beginning of their career, in their mid-career, um, the people who are independent scholars as well, right? You're both accepting pitches from people who are just interested, right? Exactly. Um, if the scholarship is there, I really don't care whether you have a PhD, an MA, a BA, nothing. If you've done the work and it's good, then... I'd like to have it in the magazine. And also, I think people like Peter and I, it's 
I think it's part of our duty. Like we have these platforms and we have this reach to sort of help people coming up and and help get them get the word out there and stuff. I, I think that's that's the whole thing, like getting more women writers and people of color and putting them in like in the magazine or on the website and just just letting them get out there and and taking just smashing that glass ceiling they in terms of like diversity it's i have to say to me i i've always wanted to just have diverse uh opinions and writers uh from all backgrounds because i i enjoy that like i think that's valuable to me i have always wanted to you know as uh, as many kind of differing views or differing backgrounds uh into this and it's it's helpful like it's helpful that we are actually able to pay people money we have the you know we have this you know, be able we with budgets all right we can help writers and if it helps a grad student out that they don't have to take another kind of job at a store uh or like you know working the late shift at the restaurant uh, but they can write you know a couple of medieval pieces a month that is all the bet- better yeah i kind of love this you've come around full circle so that you've worked so hard for so many years that you can provide beer and burger money for other people that are coming up they want to write for you and you can actually pay them to do that so yes if you are new to medieval studies or you're working on stuff you can actually pitch these two amazing people and maybe make your own beer and burger money which i think is it's a beautiful thing guys beautiful it's all about the beer and burgers that's the end game that's why i got into medieval studies (laughs) it's definitely not for the fame right not for the glamour The Twitter glamour? Nope. <laughs> well, I, I'm famous, aren't I? Oh, uh, famous in your own mind. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, thank you guys for talking to me around my kitchen table and being nice to my dog and talking about um, your experience through Medieval Studies uh, and through Medievalist.net and now evolving into all of your other work. I think that's going to be really important for people to hear especially people who are kind of at the beginning of their journey even people who are just finishing high school and maybe looking at what they want to do with themselves or or people who are have thought about writing that article you know they've been interested in something for a long time write it write it and pitch it right guys if you're passionate about the middle ages you want to learn you want to express your ideas Go for it. Our path is one way of, you know, when we create a website, but there are a lot of different paths uh, that you can achieve that. Um, and it takes learning other skills, but uh, that can be done. And it is very rewarding. At least it was rewarding for me in a personal and professional sense. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I say go for it. I think, like I said to you, everything's crumbling now. The floodgates are open. It's more accessible now is the time write it do it pitch it sell it medieval (laughs) let's leave it there (laughs) that's beautiful thanks so much guys as you mentioned sandra alvarez is the editor of ancient history magazine as well as the medieval magazine if you're interested in writing for her you can contact her via the medievalmagazine.com or follow her on twitter at medieval girl spelled the british way Peter Kanyanchny is the editor of Medieval Warfare magazine and Medievalists.net, and you can find out more about his work or find him on social media at Medievalists. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalists.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on, Peter? Hi, Danielle. Yeah, we have a bit of a, a scoop on the website. It's about the Battle of Brunaburr, uh, this uh, 10th century uh, battle in England. No one really knows where it, uh, its location is until now. So we may ha- uh, have a report about the finds, discoveries, bits of metal. Does it lead to the actual battlefield? Well, you'll have to read to find out. So we have a bit of a story on that. And also we have a really interesting piece by Megan Murray about her uh, work creating Viking Age clothing in the 21st century. And she's the founder and owner of Valkyrie Custom Wear. So she talks about doing that. Uh, so those are on the website for you to read. All right. Thanks, Peter. We'll have to check that out. Yeah. Hopefully there's some good guests this week on the podcast. <laughs> there were some great guests on the podcast this week, as you know. All right. Get out of here, man. Who was it? Who could have been? There is always so much going on with Medievalists.net and the podcast, it's hard to know where to begin. 
You can start by heading over to our Patreon page and checking out our book club or our brand new ad-free level where you can support those up-and-coming writers we were talking about earlier, as well as yours truly, and get the desktop version of Medievalist.net for just $3 per month. All that action is at patreon.com slash medievalists. As for me, my book, Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, got restocked by Amazon UK, although they're down to just two books last I checked. So if you're interested, you can pick up a copy there or through Pen and Sword History at pen-and-sword.co.uk. Thank you to all the people who have already bought the book. I so hope you enjoy it. And for the rest of the world, sit tight. It's coming to you in Australia in November, Canada in December, and the United States in January. As always, you can find up-and-coming writers as well as seriously established scholars on Medievalists.net, and you can keep up with the latest on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can follow me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media too. Just look me up under 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thank you for your part in helping independent scholars live our dream. Have yourself an awesome day. <laughs>